Welcome to another week of psychopharmacology at Northern Kentucky University. Um, this week we're going to talk about the material in chapter 11, which is on hallucinogens. So as a drug class, hallucinogens are the most confusing drug class. We, we have all kinds of drugs that fit into this broad category of hallucinogens, and they are very different drugs. They have different mechanisms of action. Um, so what draws them all together into one category is that these are drugs that alter perception, how you see things, how you are um, viewing the environment. They affect your mood and they affect how you think. So they differ very widely depending on the type. So drugs that fit into the class of hallucinogens are, are drugs like LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, PCP, MDMA, ecstasy, and salvia. Um, and hallucinations are the hallmark feature that sort of clusters these drugs together. Also, these drugs often um, result in heightened emotional states and altered senses of space and time. So they do cause some unusual effects. Um, found in about 90 species of plants, some of them are synthetic. Um, in a lot of cases, they're orally administered, so that's quite different some, than some of the other drugs that we have um, talked about. Um, sometimes they're referred to as psycho, psychotic mimetics because they mimic psychosis. Um, and so um, we, are, we have this really broad category, um, but the drugs tend to fall into five classes. So the first class is serotonergic hallucinogens. <clears throat> and these are the drugs that increase serotonin action in the brain. So um, LSD um, is a schedule one drug, meaning it's um, no medical uses for this drug. It is a synthetic drug that is um, typically orally administered and will cause very vivid visual hallucinations and extreme mood changes, um, strong distorted perceptions, um, impaired judgment. I have a lot of examples in the textbook of you know, specific things that people report when they um, use LSD. And, and this is all due to the fact of changes in the serotonin action in the brain. Also an example of a serotonergic hallucinogen is psilocybin. The mushrooms are also schedule one, meaning no medical uses, um, high abuse potential in schedule one drugs as a category. Um, they come from the mushroom plant, a very specific mushroom, not all mushrooms um, have any sort of psychoactive action. It's the particular type of mushroom here. And the effects are similar to what I just described for LSD. Also in this category is mescaline, which is from the peyote cactus. Um, it, mescaline can also be synthesized um, in the lab. And again, a schedule one drug, a lot of the similar effects that I just mentioned for LSD. <clears throat> And then it became harmaline and DMT are also plants less common, but also um, have serotonin, serotonin action. And as a result, you know, can cause visual hallucinations and things like that. Then you have the second category of methylated amphetamines. And you probably remember we talked about amphetamines in a separate chapter. So um, the methylated amphetamines um, they are, um, you know, mainly ecstasy, MDMA, synthetic, made in the lab. Um, they have stimulant effects that we talked about in the amphetamines chapter, but MDMA or ecstasy might have some more hallucinogenic effects, but far less pronounced than what I was talking about in the serotonergic hallucinogen um, category. So. LSD on the one hand, very pronounced visual hallucinations. You might see objects on the wall. You would not have the same very pronounced visual hallucinations with ecstasy, maybe more mild. Individuals will often report other things like altered perceptions of time and um, uh, feeling states. And oftentimes these drugs would be used in um, like nightclub settings. So they're often referred to sometimes um, as club drugs. 
The third category is the anticholinergic hallucinogens, and these are acetylcholine receptor antagonists. So examples of these are atropine and scopolamine. Um, they are found in plants, and um, they can cause hallucinations, del delirium, agitation, and memory disturbances. Um, people will go into a dreamlike trance or state and have no memory of the experience. And higher doses are quite dangerous. They can lead to paralysis, convulsions, and even death. So these are less commonly used drugs um, recreationally. Fourth category is the dissociative anesthetics. These are, are drugs that antagonize and NMDA glutamate receptors. Um, examples would be PCP or ketamine. Um, they produce feelings of detachment from the environment itself. So um, they will induce visual and auditory distortions and um, perhaps depending on the dose will induce anesthesia while sort of being semi-conscious. And um, ketamine is used in veterinary and pediatric medicine and sometimes also it is um, used illicitly, illegally as a date rape, date rape drug. So, um, uh, you know, th there is that, um, you know, consideration in legal cases and things like that to, to have knowledge of this category. Um, also, cough medicine, um, dextromethorphan used in cough medicine, it can be dissociative at high, very high doses as well. And then the fifth category is a new-ish um, category, and that's the kappa opiate hallucinogens. And salvia is a great example. Um, it is from the salvia um, plant, which you might have seen in, in, in your garden, if you have a garden. It is actually not controlled by the U.S. Controlled Substances Act. Doesn't have any sort of standing right now. Um, it can be both chewed or smoked, and it has extremely brief hallucinogenic effects, but because they're so short, short in duration, that's why it hasn't actually landed on the scheduling system because the effects are so fleeting. And I'll talk about that in a minute again. So current drug laws in the United States have um, schedule one drugs, no acceptable medical uses for LSD, psilocybin, MDMA. Schedule two, there's some acceptable medical uses, but limited and um, concerns about abuse potential, um, PCP and scopolamine would be in that category. Schedule three has ketamine. Um, so again, some more acceptable medical uses, but again, concerns about dependence. And then salvia, the last category I mentioned on the previous slide, the, that plant, the salvia plant is not scheduled. Currently the uh, drug enforcement administration lists it as a drug of concern. Um, it remains to be seen if it, that will change and actually land that drug on the scheduling system or not. Um, as I said, the hallucinogen effects of smoking salvia is very, very brief. And so that's why the DA is just kind of watching it. So the acute effects that you see um, are um, quite pronounced, but it's important to note that for these drugs, the non-pharmacological factors are really important to the drug experience that people report. And, and it can be expectations, what the person thinks will happen going in, what they, they perceive should be the experience, the setting that these drugs are used in. So if you use the drug in a setting that is a you know, just an office versus, you know, a, a nightclub where there's lots of people partying and loud music and flashing lights and those sorts of things. Those matter a great deal. Um, for the acute effects, serotonergic hallucinogens are very vivid hallucinations. Um, within an hour of using the drug like LSD or psilocybin or mescaline, you would have those vivid hallucinations and they can last anywhere from six to 12 hours, depending on the drug. Um, users will report things like colors seem brighter. People and objects can appear, um, they can appear changed in orientation or size. There may be increased taste and hearing acuity. 
um, synesthesia, where there's the melding of the senses, where the person reports smelling sounds or, or something like that, or, um, you know, just the, the crossing of the, the senses um, is, you know, something unusual. Sense of detachment, disconnected from reality, um, feeling sort of a sense of spiritualness and mixed mood, um, labile mood and, and euphoria is also reported. Uh, physically, the fight or flight response is induced, the sympathetic nervous system is activated, so there will be increased blood pressure and heart rate, body temperature, sweating, dilated pupils, loss of appetite, um, you know, uh, impaired motor coordination um, will also be um, reported <clears throat> in some cases. Um, particularly for people who use these drugs repeatedly, they are more and more likely to experience very negative, averse reactions. They're sometimes called bad trips where they have very frightening, scary hallucinations. They feel very confused and extremely paranoid, disorientated and panicky. And, and um, in many cases, um, you know, they, they could actually injure themselves or someone else or deaths have occurred because of poor judgment. Um, you know, the drug leads them to, to think strange thoughts and, and, you know, so, you know, maybe someone thinks they can fly and then they jump out of a window and then they kill themselves um, because they have this mistaken notion um, because of the drug. And um, so the drug itself won't directly lead to the death of the person, but the drug is leading the person to, to think thoughts that are not connected to reality. And then the person might actually succumb to some sort of accident or injury or something like that. MDMA um, also has hallucinogenic and stimulant effects. It alters people's perception of time. It is more of a mild hallucination compared to the serotonergic hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. Um, people will report euphoria and warmth, empathy, openness. Um, they just feel a diminished sense of defensiveness and they feel more sociable and talkative. Um, and so you can see why recreational users um, have used these drugs in a party situation. Um, you know, the appeal for using it um, to add to the, the warm atmosphere is why that users might lead themselves to try them. Physical effects include, again, the fight or flight response, increased heart rate, sympathetic nervous system activation that increases blood pressure, um, suppressed appetite. Um, the person also will experience quite a bit of tension like muscle tension and bruxism, which is the grinding of the teeth, elevated body temperature and dehydration, especially in a club setting where they may be drinking alcohol as well and it's really hot and people are dancing. Um, that can lead to like serious um, health conditions when the person gets extremely dehydrated and doesn't realize it. Now, what about the chronic effects of hallucinogens? Well, the one thing that's true about this category of drugs is that they're used less consistently than other recreational drugs. You know, they're kind of reserved for, you know, parties or, or here and there as an experience. They tend not to be used on a daily basis. So when you ask individuals who use categories of, of these drugs, are they dependent on them? You don't seem to get indications that there's dependence. Um, so indications of chronic effects are more limited. The, the only thing that is sort of concerning is the flashbacks that you sometimes have with people who have used hallucinogens like LSD, um, where they, they recurringly have what was like the drug experience, even though there's no drug in their system. So if LSD induces a visual hallucination, and then later on, they have the same visual hallucination, but there's no drug in their system, that'd be like a flashback. It's sometimes induced by stress. And individuals who repeatedly have this problem can actually be di diagnosed with hallucinogen-induced persisting perceptual disorder. Um, so, um, you know, there's not much that we can really do for these people as, as opposed to just being supportive therapy. Um, so it's a little unclear, you know, how we can help people beyond that. Um, 
it, use is also more problematic for those at risk for psychosis. Um, so if someone has a genetic predisposition to psychosis, then um, these drugs would be more problematic and leading to serious concerns. And then MDMA um, ecstasy has been associated with a bunch of cardiovascular problems and uh, memory impairments, sleep impairments, even some brain damage. So there's um, health concerns with the use of that. What about tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal? So tolerance can develop, but use is often not chronic. So you don't see a whole lot of evidence of significant tolerance. Also cross tolerance can develop for drugs in the same category. So if you recall LSD and the psilocybin, um, those are both from the serotonergic hallucinogen category. And so they act very similarly in the brain. And so if you have tolerance developing to LSD, then it would cross to another drug in the same category. It reverses, um, tolerance reverses rapidly with abstinence. So you stop using, you won't see the same tolerance. And then if someone stops using, they don't tend to exhibit any craving for um, these drugs. So as a result, we really don't see serious dependence on these drugs. Um, we don't even see much of withdrawal symptoms. You know, sometimes with MDMA or ecstasy, we see maybe mild transient withdrawal symptoms, like the person feels kind of depressed, might feel a bit of pain and difficulty sleeping, but that's about it. So these, these drugs in this category don't tend to cause serious problems. Um, the pharmacology, it depends on the category. So with the serotonergic hallucinogens, those LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, those drugs are stimulating serotonin receptors and resulting in increased serotonin activity in the brain. Um, and, you know, depending on, on the drug, you might see um, absorption within 60 minutes with oral administration, and then peak blood levels might start to show up at three hours, and the duration of action can last a really long time from six to 12 hours with LSD being more like on the 12 hour range compared to psilocybin on the six hour range. What you find is that um, some of the accidents and injuries occur because um, people are having scary hallucinations that last for long durations of time and the drug is not wearing off. So, um, you know, that long duration of action for LSD can be problematic for that reason. You know, um, if someone is not connected to reality, not in touch with reality, then um, having something in your system for 12 hours that is inducing that effect could be quite, quite concerning. MDMA, a little bit of the pharmacology, it acts like amphetamines. It's going to increase dopamine. Um, and it also acts like hallucinogens in increasing serotonin activity. So that's why we sort of um, put them in this category, even though they're, tr they're amphetamines. And I could have easily, you know, you could put, you know, MDMA in the amphetamine chapter and it would make sense because of the um, amphetamine action on dopamine, but because you're hallucinating, it probably belongs in this chapter. It also can um, increase release of acetylcholine um, and um, the duration of action is about eight hours. Peak effects you're gonna see within three um, detectable in urine for three to four days, which is kind of interesting because there's been some studies that have looked at, you know, um, uh, sewer water and looked at, you know, um, you can tell cities that have use of MDMA by analyzing the sewer water after use after weekends and things like that. So it's kind of interesting, the toxicology that you can um, investigate using different methods. So what about treatment? Do people who use hallucinogens need treatment? Probably not. Few patients seek treatment uh, for hallucinogens. Um, individuals in treatment sometimes use hallucinogens, no doubt, but that tends to be not the primary drug that leads them to need treatment um, because craving and compulsive drug seeking, seeking are not reported. You don't have much dependence or withdrawal symptoms. And so um, individuals just, tend not to seek out treatment for after using this class of drugs. Interestingly, some of these hallucinogens have been tested as treatment for other problems. 
So MDMA or ecstasy is being tested for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans and ketamine has been um, investigated for the treatment of depression. So I go into the chapter a little bit about these different approaches and you know what the evidence looks like. It's because it is an interesting sort of avenue of, of potential new medications to see if you know in the right doses, in the right setting, do some of these drugs make sense um, for for treating various conditions and certainly having more treatments for major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder would be really, really helpful for large numbers of patients. Okay, and that's the end of that mini lecture. Let me know if you have any questions. Have a great week, everyone.